Well, welcome to episode 358 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. And this is a special episode. I'm going to talk this time about jazz records which fly under the radar. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'll get to that in a second. One of the great pleasures of collecting jazz records, or really any records, is discovering how much beauty there is once you get out to the margins of general popular taste or well-known pieces of music. And by that, I mean that there's a real joy of discovering that you've picked up a record, maybe just for the heck of it, or as part of a box of things you picked up or what have you, that turns out, even though you've never heard of it, it's actually really good. So this week I went through my collection and I pulled out 18 records, which, well, I call them records that fly under the radar. I could have also said that these are records that are slightly off the beaten track. And what do I mean by that? Well, for the most part of the 18 records I'm going to talk about, the leaders are not unknown, but little known, with one or two exceptions. They're not people that are going to trouble anybody who's making a hundred greatest musicians in jazz list. Uh, they're typically musicians who are only really well known to jazz collectors and maybe even collectors of a particular genre. Um, their records often have very few write-ups and these records in particular might not have been reissued much. If you look at the listings on Discogs, you probably don't find any reviews or comments below them or so on. Um, there may not even be reviews on all music and other kinds of sort of online resources, or they may have been released on smaller labels and so it didn't have that much reach. And those characteristics basically apply to most of the records I'm going to talk about in this video. There are some exceptions where the artists themselves are well known, but this is a little bit of an oddity in their catalog or it's an archival release, or it's otherwise an outlier in their catalog, which means that this particular record is not often discussed. Anyway, presuming that's all clear as mud, I'm certain that when I produce some of these records, people will say, what do you mean so-and-so is not that well-known? Well, they weren't that well-known to me, and I suspect they are not that well-known to most people watching this video. So let's start with number one, which is this record, uh, led by Conte Candoli. There he is, a tremendous trumpet player, and he had a brother, Pete, um, who was also a wonderful musician. And this is Little Band Big Jazz. As you can see here, it says it was recorded in Hollywood in February 1960. It has pretty much an all-star lineup of West Coast musicians. And I will just confess uh, early on in this video that many of the records, not all of them, but many of the records I'm talking about uh, in this video are uh, West Coast records because I've been doing a little more obscure digging in that area. So uh, again, the people here, Conti Candoli, wonderful trumpet player, Buddy Collette, Great and somewhat underrated uh, sax and clarinet player, for that matter. Uh, Vince Guaraldi, he, of course, of Charlie Brown fame. There he is on the piano. Leroy Vinegar, the wonderful master of the walking bass line. And the great Stan Levy on drums. This is a very strong, hard-swinging date composed mostly of original compositions. There's a real veracity to this album cover, and it really does look exactly like what it is, which is a good, old-fashioned, hard-working uh, jazz date. Uh, full of a bunch of all-stars from 1960. The producer, who is the producer here? Um, I'm not even sure because it's this is an Eros release. Eros is a British label, and it originally came out on Crown in the U.S. Crown records often have a lot of surface noise because they use recycled vinyl. That's not the case with Eros. So maybe I'm also saying get the U.K. release if you can. Anyway, the music is just terrific. It's just some of the best, hardest-swinging kind of, I guess, bop, hard bop, cool jazz, not really. It's much more of a bop date, I would say. You would not regret picking this record up if you can find it. It's a little obscure, but definitely recommended by me. The next record I have, which is a little below the radar, is this one, uh, the Johnny Smith Quartet. This pops up here and there uh, for sale. You can find it with relative ease. It's got a rather funny cover because he's you know, looking through this kind of warped glass. I don't know whether it's a photograph effect or or uh, whether it was actually shot through some kind of marbled glass or what have you. Anyway, Johnny Smith is probably best known for two things. One was a record he cut called Moonlight in Vermont, which was best known for basically being a launching pad for Stan Getz's career. And the second is that he wrote and recorded the original version of Walk Don't Run, which of course the Ventures turned into a big surf hit in the 1960s. This is not a surf record. This is a jazz record from the 50s. So exactly when, I'm not sure. And of course, it's one of those covers that doesn't really say, um, but sometime mid 50s. And it's a nice, quite swinging set, basically guitar-led quartet, and 
there's a fair number of ballots on here, but there's some pretty good swingy numbers here as well. Um, you won't regret in any way picking this up, particularly if you're a fan of jazz guitar. So uh, recommended if you can stumble across it. The next record I have, that last one was, uh, I think, an East Coast record. Now we're back to the West Coast. This is, um, actually, it's in beautiful condition. You can see the lamination on this. This is one of a very small number of records put out by a label called Mode Records, which are notable, amongst other things, for these fantastic painted portraits of the artist, all done by a woman called Eva Diana, or Ava Diana. And there's only a few of them. Richie Kimuka has one. There's a couple of others as well. Anyway, they're a little bit hard to find, but they're absolutely fantastic. Well, they're hard to find in their original versions. I think they've been uh, reissued in recent years, and they're not too expensive. Anyway, Stan Lee, I mentioned him before. He was in the Conte Candoli record. He was a veteran of the early bebop years, but he really made his name out on the West Coast with the Lighthouse All-Stars and so on, and a bit of a giant of that scene. And this is just an excellent, excellent record. Um, no great surprise that people are on it. Quite a lot of overlap, actually, with the other record, the Conte Candoli record. Uh, Lou Levy is on here on piano. Monty Budwig is on bass. But uh, Stan Levy, no relation, and Conte Candoli are here. And Richie Kimuka, the great tenor player, is uh is on here as well so anyway super worth picking up if you find it or if you find any of these mode records with these painted uh, portraits they're all worth a shot because they're wonderfully recorded and the music is excellent this next record is one of two cannonball Adderley discovery records on riverside and cannonball for a while in the late 50s was working basically as an a and r man as well as a musician obviously for riverside records and in particular, he would go out to the West Coast and he would check out the scene there and he would recommend people for Orrin Keep News to sign and record. And one of those people is Roosevelt Wardell, who does not go on to do a ton of other stuff after this. But this is a really lovely record. And it's got Sam Jones and Lewis Hayes. Sam Jones is the bassist. Lewis Hayes, the drummer from Cannonball's regular group. And they're backing up uh, Roosevelt Wardell here. It is... I, well, it's always tough to classify piano players, but I would say, if anything, it's Bud Powell-ish with a little hint of Bill Evans. This record has, I think, on all music, an inexplicable two out of five stars rating. There's no review to accompany it, of course, but it is very typical of the high-quality, straight-ahead hard bop that Riverside was associated with in the later 50s. Nothing too challenging, but the quality of the playing is excellent. Lots of variety on here as well for a trio record and a piano trio record at that. So anyway, strongly recommended. The next record is the second of those two uh, Cannonball recommendations or Cannonball Adderley Discoveries. And it's this record by James Clay, A Double Dose of Soul. And James Clay is an interesting guy. He was equally adept on both the tenor sax and the flute. He was kicking around in L.A. in the later 50s. He made one record with a guy called Lawrence Marable, a drummer, and actually I've got that record in here too, called Tenor Man. But uh, he didn't really make things stick, and he, I don't know if he was homesick or what it was, but he went back to Texas shortly thereafter. But while he'd been out in L.A. playing with Marable, Cannonball had heard him. And so Cannonball came back out looking for him, couldn't find him, figured out he'd gone to Texas, got hold of him in Texas, and asked him to come back to L.A. to make this record, which they do. It is absolutely fantastic. In fact, I'd say as good as his tenor playing is, Clay is one of the great jazz flute players. But no sooner is this record made, and I think actually one other as well, than he was back to Texas and basically played locally, but pretty much hung up any aspirations he had of a bigger jazz career. So anyway, this record kind of drifted into obscurity. You can find it here and there. I don't know if it's been reissued, but I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you grab a copy if you can find one. Next is another guy who had his moment in the sun, but then things didn't necessarily go all that well for it. It's a guy called Brew Moore. Now, Brew, of course, is not his given name, but it was his nickname, and it was apparently well-earned. And he is one of those Lester Young-influenced tenors that populated the West Coast with some frequency in the 1950s. This is a delicious set, and it's followed up with another record he makes with the same group or close on, shortly thereafter. But unfortunately, his refueling habits get the better of him and kind of prevent him from being all he could be. He eventually goes off to Europe and has a moderate degree of success there. But this is him near his peak. It's prime Lester Young-influenced tenor playing. It's just gorgeous. 
absolutely, you should grab it. Now, seem to be a bit of a West Coast stretch here, but uh, this one is one of a number of records that I could have picked, which feature Bill Perkins and Richie Kamuka, and they collaborated in quite a few. This one I picked because it also has Art Pepper, the great alto saxophonist. And this is basically a record that's got so much talent on it, it's absolutely overflowing. Hampton Hawes is on here, the great bass player Red Mitchell is on here. It is excellent from start to finish. I mean, there's a few others you could pick up as well along the same vein, like uh, The Brothers, which is done with Al Cohn and also Perkins and Kamuka, or Tenors Head On, which is Perkins and Kamuka. Those are also really good, but this is maybe the pick of the crop because of Pepper's contribution. Now, finally, switch of gears, move away from the West Coast all the way to the United Kingdom, and this is an experimental record with a truly, truly awful cover. Uh, I don't know what they were thinking, but uh, in any event, I guess it made sense at the time. This is Joe Harriet's record, the Indo Jazz Suite, and this is actually a double quintet record. Joe Harriet was a guy, Jamaican guy, comes to fame playing effectively straight ahead jazz in the UK in the 1950s, but then quickly moves into the avant-garde space. He's kind of a contemporary of Ornette Coleman's, and he does a reasonable approximation of a free jazz revolution in the UK at the same time that Coleman is doing what he's doing in LA and New York. He then moves into not just free jazz, but also what you might call the spiritual zone and a lot of fusion type work as well. One of his fusion activities was trying to blend jazz and Indian music. And so this record is two quintets. It's Harriet's Straight Ahead, or, well, not Straight Ahead, but certainly Harriet's Pure Jazz Quintet, and then a group of five Indian musicians led by a guy called John Mayer, and I don't know if that's Mayer on the cover. It may or may not be. This is highly experimental. It's the kind of record that you would almost expect would probably not work, given that it was very early. It was 1966, right? So the Beatles are just experimenting with Indian music and fusion with Western music. It's very early in that whole trajectory. All kinds of reasons why this would not work. I would say it's not a perfect record, but it is surprisingly effective, this fusion, this mashup, and definitely very, very listenable. I think there was a related follow-up to this record. Well, I'm not sure, but in any event, what's interesting about this, in addition to the fact that it works, is that the Indian aspects of the music are not just, you know, here's a little bit of sitar here and there, sort of, coloring around the edges of a jazz record. The Indian music is front and center, and on some tracks is really the dominant element. So anyway, like I say, well worth spinning. Now, from England, we hurtle back to the west coast of North America to this one uh, by a guy called Jack Montrose, although it's a little bit deceiving to say it's by him because it largely features his, well, it does feature entirely his arrangements, as it says, arranged by Montrose. Um, if you follow the West Coast jazz scene at all, you'll know that arrangers were kind of a big thing to a far greater degree than they were on uh, the East Coast. And what that really means, I've come to understand, is that the head arrangements are just longer on the West Coast pieces than they are the East Coast jazz. But in any event, all of the tracks on here are arranged by Montrose, but there are two different groups, one on side A, one on side B. And the one on side B features not just Shelley Mann, the great drummer, but Clifford Brown, the all-world trumpeter, who hurtled to the peak of the jazz trumpet world in a few years than he was at the top before sadly dying in a car accident in 1956. Anyway, he's all over side two, and it is just incredible. Side two is worth the price of admission for this record. It doesn't look like much, and you know, who's heard of Jack Montrose? Really, not very many people, but 100% this record is worth picking up. Now, switching gears a little bit, here we have, from 1970, a really prime piece of not particularly well-known spiritual jazz. So if you're into Pharaoh Sanders and Alice Coltrane and that kind of music, or Leon Thomas or Lonnie Liston Smith, this is really going to tickle your fancy. Kenny Gill, not that well-known, did not put too many records out, but this is absolutely not just typical of that era of music, but a fine and shining example of that era of music in particular. There's a track on here, uh, called Valley of All Brothers, which happily put on, you know, a Desert Island Discs listing of spiritual jazz tracks from the late 60s and early 70s. Anyway, funny little cover, and not a lot of people that you would really know about here. The only real name on here is a guy called Norman Connors on the drums. Um, otherwise, 
pretty anonymous crew, um, but again, uh, an excellent record. Now we're back to the West Coast, and I did admit that's kind of the direction I was going here. So this is a piece, so this is a so this is a 10 inch record, as you can see by its 10 inchness, by Lenny Niehaus, who is probably better known historically for the work he did doing soundtracks for Clint Eastwood movies later on in Clint's career, things like Unforgiven and so on. Those things were done by Lenny Niehaus. But he's also a fine alto player, and he was a mainstay of some of the very earliest releases on Contemporary in 1954 and 1955. This has since been released as a 12-inch, and there are other compilations of his work that he did for Contemporary in the 1950s, um, all of which are worth gathering. But this one, you know, you find it here and there, particularly the 12-inch release is just kicking about, but it is a really fantastic record. It's beautifully recorded, like almost every Contemporary recording was. It has an enormous mix of styles, everything from, you know, really kind of cutting edge, contemporary, modern jazz, mid 1950s, but there's a little bit of even ragtime influence in there and certainly, you know, more traditional jazz approaches. Beautifully played, very exciting, very swinging. Pick it up. This next record is one of those ones, it's actually by a very well-known artist, but it's a bit of an outlier in his catalog. And this is Ben Webster at the Renaissance. Now let's get something out of the way right away. This is a truly abysmal record cover. It's a cover which says, I'm a record made in the 1980s when jazz was kind of out of gas and the out of gasness of jazz is replicated in the half-hearted lukewarm milk toast art that we've got on this cover. Although this record inside has nothing to do with the 1980s. The music was actually recorded in 1960 in LA. It's Webster with a small group. It's a wonderfully warm and intimate and at times mellow record. There's a fantastic version of Georgia on my mind on here. One of the definitive versions I would say of that track. And anyway, highly recommended, despite this horrible, horrible cover. Now, we come to the record of featuring James Clay, which I mentioned before. The one, this is the one he made with Lawrence Marable, Tenor Man, and it came out on Jazz West. Clay, of course, I mentioned his story and him going back to Texas and so on. This was one of his you know, brief moments when he was out in L.A., but this is a great record. Marable is a drummer he'd played with Art Pepper, he played with Chet Baker, but again, not a guy who made much of a splash, but this record was just one of those ones where everything comes together. It features Clay just on tenor, no flute this time, and it's one of those records which makes you realize that not everybody who is musically brilliant makes the big time. Okay, the next little obscurity is a record that I have talked about once or twice, I think just maybe once on this channel, and it is this record, the Lorindo Almeida Quartet, featuring Bud Shank. Now, Bud Shank, of course, was an alto player who was a real feature of well, Pacific jazz. In particular, this record comes out on Pacific. Almeida was a Brazilian guitarist who had washed up in L.A. in the late 40s, I think, and had made himself a reasonable career there. He was doing work with the studios and so on. But this record is particularly fascinating because it is not a bossa nova record but it is the record which creates bossa nova because what almeida and shank do is create a fusion of pretty mellow very kind of pastoral sounding guitar and saxophone combinations similar to the kinds of sax and guitar combinations that we hear about 10 years later with the uh, getz and joao gilberto and the records that they made but of course those later records are Bossa Nova records. Bossa Nova did not exist in 19, whatever this was, um, 1957, uh, or earlier actually, because this is actually a, a reissue of some 10 inch records which came up previously. What happened was the Brazilian guys, Joao Gilberto and Antonio Carlos Jobim and all that crew down in Rio bought these records, thought, wow, this sounds like exactly the kind of music we want to play, except it doesn't have the right rhythm. So they added in a new rhythm, the one we now know as a Bossa Nova rhythm, and create this whole new genre, unbeknownst to Bud Shank, who had no idea these records were being influential down in Brazil. Years later, 1963, 64, thereabouts, he's touring Brazil, and he arrives there to give a concert, and he is an instant celebrity. It's kind of like searching for Sugar Man, only the other way around. And he's shocked to find he is an absolute musical star in Brazil, and all these major musical figures who have created all this worldwide boom in Bossa Nova have all his records. 
So he then becomes a late convert to playing bossa nova. So it kind of comes full circle. Anyway, this is the beginning of it all. This is the record, and you can hear it. You play it. It's bossa nova without being bossa nova. It doesn't have the beat, but it has the feel. The next record is an East Coast record. It's on New Jazz, which was a prestige sub imprint, and it's led by George Wallington. Now, George Wallington was a guy, he would played with the big bands, he would played with the beboppers, and then in the heyday of hard bop in the 1950s, he would led small groups all the way through the 1950s, but he never personally had much success. His sidemen, people like, for instance, Donald Byrd, would go on to much greater things than he ever did. In fact, this record's made in 1957, but two years previously, he had given Donald Byrd his start in New York by including him in his group. As I say, this record was made in 1957. It's not released until 1959. Byrd is back here, along with uh, Phil Woods, who's maybe in as good a form here playing alto sax as he is on any record I've ever heard. And this is full of prime, late 50s, New York-style hard bop, Byrd, Woods, Everybody in this record is in great, great form. And then Wallington, pretty soon after this record is released, leaves the music business for 25 years and goes and works in his family's air conditioning business. Now, back to the West Coast for this next one, which is the Marty Page Quartet featuring Art Pepper. Yet again, Art is, I think, just out of jail when he makes this record and is looking to make some coin. And Marty Page says, come on. Marty Page is a guy who in the 50s basically flitted back and forth between the big movie studios and the jazz clubs. He didn't do a lot of small group work. Most of the stuff he does is, is basically composing and arranging sort of for much bigger jazz orchestras, um, the kind that they were using in the movies at the time. But uh, here it's a small group, and it's absolutely excellent because, of course, this really is an Art Pepper record. It's not really a Marty Page record. Pepper has some compositions on here, as well as being in really sparkling form all the way through. It is on Tampa Records. Now, Tampa was one of these little L.A. labels that had the unfortunate tendency to use recycled vinyl. So on almost any Tampa recording, you're going to hear uh, a kind of a, there'll be a level of surface noise. But that issue aside, the recording itself is top notch. So as soon as the music kicks in, I find that you forget about the surface noise and Pepper's alto in particular is beautifully captured all the way through. A real must have this one actually, but not really much discussed and a little bit hard to find in its original version, but you can find uh, reissues of it, I think, for not too much cash. The second last record I'm going to talk about is a bit of an odd one actually. It's probably the most big bandy, well, it's an octet um, record that I'm going to show you. And when you look at the cover, there's almost no way, well, there is no way of telling actually who's on this record. It's named West Coast Jazz and Hi-Fi. It's actually um, a record cover that they were forced to adopt because the original cover of the record, which is Jazz Erotica, was seen as a bit naughty, and uh, they had to dispense with it because record stores wouldn't sell it. So they went for this very kind of generic thing, West Coast Jazz and Hi-Fi. It's on Hi-Fi records, and it was actually pulled together as kind of a promotional record for the label. And the producer basically picks eight musicians he thinks are pretty good. One of them is Bill Holman, who's also a great arranger. And Holman, I believe, is credited as the leader of the record. I'm not sure he is on the jazz erotica versions. But in any event, there are eight musicians here, including Vince Guaraldi, here he is again, uh, Richie Kamuka, here he is again, Conti Candoli, here he is again, Stan Levy, here he is again, um, Monty Budwig, another West Coast stalwart, and so on. And it was pulled together basically to promote the style of jazz these guys were playing um, in the name of this record label. I don't know how successful the marketing was, but I can tell you this is a pretty good record. And I, as you may know, I'm not big on groups of more than six people playing jazz, but I'm willing to make an exception for this one because the quality of the soloing in particular is excellent. The final record I'm going to talk about is one which is led by a very high profile jazz musician. But it is atypical of much of that person's product. And that musician is, of course, Charles Mingus. This is a record you may know, but if you do know it, you're unlikely to know it because somebody said, well, this is the best Charles Mingus record to get. This is routinely listed as one of Mingus's sort of throwaway records, one you don't really have to worry about listening to. I think on Rate Your Music, I saw some list where some guy had put together Mingus's best 36 records, and this was number 35. Um, always wonder about those exercises. But in any event, uh, and it's also on a very small label, it's on Jubilee Records, 
And it is a real anomaly in Mingus's catalog because it is a trio, first of all, of course, he famously did Money Jungle a few years later. This is a trio with the wonderful piano player Hampton Hawes and Danny Richmond, who worked with Mingus a lot, also has his own record on, uh, on Impulse, which is a bit of an oddity itself. Hawes is in spectacular form on this record, but the main reason that I love it is that it, I like Mingus, but I sometimes find the atmospherics on his records a bit much, and that there's a lot going on, there's a lot of shouting. It feels like the tide is coming in, the tide's going out, like there are, you know, the Red Seas are parting, there are caravans of migrants, you know, all this is all happening at the same time, you know, Mingus is playing music. There's just always a lot going on on his records. This is not like that at all. It's stripped down, straight ahead, trio jazz, wonderfully recorded, and so what you get as a fan of Mingus is the opportunity to just to listen to his really great bass playing without all the rest of the stuff that often comes with Mingus records. Everyone has their own taste and what they like, but I have to say that this is one of the recordings by Mingus that I love very much. So there you have it. There are some 18 records that fly below the radar or off the beaten path, the road less traveled, what have you. Those are the ones that I pulled out of my collection today. I would love to hear in the comments about any unheralded gems you have in your own collection. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.